Uh, Mavis Beatty, uh, who was one of the Bletchley Park codebreakers, um, was going to give our keynote address, but for reasons I'm sure you'll understand, she cannot uh, be here. But we have a statement from her, and we have a, 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 the, the address that she was going to offer, which will be delivered by Kate Adie, who I know will be uh, known to just about everybody in this room, from uh, Tiananmen Square in 1989 through the Balkans to from our own correspondent. Um, Kate Adie has been uh, part of the fabric of our information uh, in the United Kingdom as a very respected journalist uh, and as a presenter uh, and is one of the faces, I think, of uh, women in the media uh, in the United Kingdom and internationally. And I'm delighted that Kate, who was with us yesterday, uh, is able to read uh, Mavis's statement today. Kate. Uh, if I may preface this by saying that one of the aspects of information today is we expect it instantly, uh, even with military operations. It's now been expected that we will not wait for years to hear what happened and why it happened. There is a great thirst for information instantly. Uh, not so with World War II, and especially with two groups of people whom I remember interviewing um, uh, during my journalistic career, um, the ladies of SOE, Special Operations um, Executive, uh, some of whom right to today refused to say what they did, saying, I gave my oath that I would say nothing. There's a lady who lives on top of a mountain in Jamaica. I tried and tried, <laughs> but still no. And the other group were the people who worked at Bletchley Park, Many women, indeed, were involved in this top-secret work, and they themselves were prevented, as you will hear, from saying things for many years. But even so, there are still some of them, just one or two, who still have never spoken about it. And many went to their grave, having breathed not a word about this work background to Mavis is that she was born in 1921 and she worked as a code breaker during the war at Wet Bletchley Park. She'd been studying German Romanticism at University College London when the war broke out. Seeing the links between her studies and the Nazi context, she applied to the Foreign Office and was posted to Bletchley Park. It was there that she assisted in Dilly Knox's section, working to break the Enigma machine codes. In Mavis' own words, she was thrown in at the deep end and just expected to get on with the work. Often the section would be tasked with jumbo rush, which meant working flat out for days and nights until the mission had been accomplished and the coded message broken. Despite the frenetic nature of the work, it was not until the Official History of British Intelligence was published in 1990 that Mavis really understood what the haste of Jumbo Rush had really meant. For many decades after the war had ended, Mavis and her husband, a fellow code breaker, had been unable to talk about their work, and it was only this year that the document she'd helped to write in 1945 relating to their work was finally declassified. And this is her memoir. I was fortunate to be recruited to Bletchley Park as a German linguist when I was halfway through my studies, and I was told to report to the famous Dilly Knox, who masterminded the breaking of Enigma machines in this country. I had no idea what an enigma machine was and was hardly any the wiser when he looked up and said, Hello, we're breaking machines, have you got a pencil? And handed me a blunt pencil and a pile of utter gibberish. One was just thrown in at the deep end and told to get on with it in Dilly's section. Working for an eccentric genius whose motto was nothing is impossible at the most formative years of my life clearly made a lasting impression. He was an eminent classical scholar and papyrologist before he turned to wartime cryptography and was always, imp and always impressed on us that a scholar must see work through from beginning to end, whatever that entailed. When the Enigma problems were solved and his section became known as Intelligence Services Knox, ISK for short, its traffic immediately became operational. Dilly's staff never knew exactly what the operational crisis was, but word would come through, jumbo rush, which meant working flat out, perhaps for days and nights, until the mission was said to have been accomplished and the last message needed was broken. 
In later life, my husband, who'd been part of the setup, would say to me when, in the days before personal computers, I would rush to catch the last post, There's no jumbo rush, old girl. Men's lives don't depend on it any more. But habits learned at Bletchley die hard. It was not until the official history of British intelligence was published in 1990 that we really knew what Jumbo Rush was all about. And it was only two months ago at the Enigma reunion that GCHQ released to Bletchley Park the ISK report, where it explained how it was done. The histories of Hut 6 and Hut 8, dealing with the Army, Navy and Air Force material, were published some years ago, but ours related to the German Secret Service, the Abwehr, the equivalent of MI6 and MI5, and we were told it would never be declassified. I am the last survivor of the four contributors who wrote it in 1945, Dilly having died in 1943, and am overwhelmed trying to piece cryptographic work with action in the field. Our messages had been crucial to the double cross system which had been put in place in early 1941 when it was decided to try and turn captured spies into double agents who could send back false information to their unsuspecting controllers in neutral countries on their own wireless sets as directed by their case officers. However, until Dilly broke the Abwehr Enigma machine on which their reports were sent on to Berlin, and by the questions they asked back, their reactions were not discovered. After the break, there, were a, there was a greater ability to advance effective strategic deception. Deception concerned fictitious minefields and defences, and most importantly, misinformation about the North African Allied landings in 1942, Sicily in 1943, with the trump card of the Normandy landings in 1944. Under MI6's need-to-know defence and security policy, you only knew the aspect of your own work without knowing the whole picture, and so we knew nothing about the double cross except how to break the messages involved. Furthermore, under the Official Secrets Act, we couldn't talk about our work at Bletchley for 30 years, which accounts for the patchiness of veterans' memories. My husband and I were better off as we could talk to each other when the family was not around. They never knew anything about it until they were grown up, although I gather they were rather suspicious that we could always beat everybody at Scrabble. <laughs> so... What was the legacy Bletchley Park left us from our wartime careers? I became a part-time tutor in landscape history at Oxford External Studies and a heritage campaigner. Trying to interpret historic landscapes through observation was somewhat akin to solving enigma puzzles. The 1960s were the days of new lives, new landscapes, and there was no place for the conservation of historic landscapes with roads being put through historic parks. Adhering to my nothing is impossible and keep at it until you get there training, I persevered through the Historic Buildings Council, the Civic Society, the Ancient Monuments Society, the Royal Parks and the CPRE until legislation was finally passed when I was first the Secretary and then President of the Garden History Society. It made my day when the archers rang to say they would ask the people of Ambridge to look for their historic landscapes. <laughs> Women who worked at Bletchley Park have much to be grateful for, living in the relaxed atmosphere of a country house with a landscape garden. Civilian codebreakers, like myself, were especially fortunate. This was a remarkable community where neither rank nor status counted, and a girl of 19 with a bright idea would be encouraged to take it forward, and this long before any official equality for women. Throughout Bletchley Park and its outstations, all that mattered was getting the job done in a win-or-lose war situation, with no thought of bonus, promotion or steps-up ladders wherever or whoever you were. Perhaps these are lessons for the common good today in another dire situation. Thank you. <laughs>